All right, so welcome to chapter two. We're going to go over um, and learn new things today about uh, chemistry. We're going to learn about what we call scientific measurements. All right, now scientific measurements isn't that fancy of a word. I'm sure you guys have heard of you've heard of scientific measurements before. Um, but essentially, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about um, physical, chemical properties. We're going to be talking about um, what um, it means to, to, to do uh, chemical, physical measurements, right, of different materials. Um, so, let's get to it. Um, physical properties. Now, we talked about physical reactions before. So, physical properties are these sort of things, you know, melting, boiling, vapor, pressure, uh, essentially how much uh, material is in a gas phase and inside a container, for example. Uh, density, conductivity, all of these are physical properties, okay? Um, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, that's a physical property, states of matter, okay? Um, chemical properties, they all kind of are distinguishable by, uh, um, you can usually tell when we're describing a chemical reaction we, or a property, we say something like, that material reacts with an acid, or that re material oxidizes or corrodes, right, decomposes. All of these are kind of descriptions of, of different chemical reactions, so different chemical reactions, right? All right, so if magnesium metal is gray, is that a chemical or a physical property? Physical. That's right, physical. Its color is just kind of describing what it is. If I say it tarnishes in air, what is that? Chemical. That's right, chemical. It just, it's describing how it reacts with our oxygen. Uh, if it melts at 922 Kelvin, what's that? Physical. That's right. We said that melting was a physical reaction. Uh, it reacts violently with hydrochloric acid. Chemical. That's right. Chemical reaction. Very good. So, physical and chemical reactions, uh, we can know about simply by understanding what we're referring to, okay? Um, so, which of the following is a, a chemical property? Why don't you take a look at that and see? Oh, it reacts violently with sodium. That's right, reacts violently with sodium. Color of water, that's its physical property. The point at which it boils, that's uh, its physical property as well, all right? I wanna show you what happens when we put some sodium into water. Here we have a little bit of sodium on a little kind of a stand, and we're going to place it into water. Watch what happens. Did you hear that? Yeah. Okay, so that was an explosion, basically, right? So the sodium reacts violently with the water, right? And we're going to want to kind of remember that for other reasons moving forward. Have you ever seen that before? I don't think so. Maybe on YouTube. Yeah, maybe. Okay, physical reaction. Physical reaction, we, we kind of explored this before a little bit, but in the case of taking water liquid, going to water solid, no change in chemistry, uh, same material, it's just undergoing different types of what we call intermolecular interactions. We'll have a whole chapter where we talk about those in the future. So, to go from liquid to solid, you lower the temperature, and what do we call that? Freezing. Yeah, you freeze it. Go from liquid to solid, you freeze it. And all you're really doing is slowing down the water molecules. Here's a video that talks about the different Matter states of matter. Matter can be found in any of four states. states. Solid, solid, liquid, gas, or plasma. Solid can be changed to liquid by melting. Solids can be changed directly to gas in a process called sublimation. Liquids change to gas by boiling. Gas can condense to liquid. Solids can be formed directly from gas by crystallization. A plasma is a group of positive ions and unbound electrons. Plasmas can be produced by energizing gases to give up electrons, as in this neon sign at fluorescent too. The sun is also a plasma. Over 99% of the matter found in the universe is in the plasma state. Okay, so um, we don't deal with plasma, and we don't really talk much about plasma in this class at all, but it's, it's a condition, like was mentioned, where the, uh, the uh, um, 
pressure is low, but you're in the, the gaseous state, but at high temperatures. Now we do have plasma in our, our light bulbs often nowadays, right? Um, the tubes <coughs> contain a gas inside there that uh, um, electricity passes through, and as the atoms accept the electrons that are passing through, the atoms are energized and they, they give off light. Right? So um, those are the states of matter. There's another state of matter, which is called a Bose-Einstein condensate. And it happens when you get solid really, really cold. And um, it's very interesting. If you go on YouTube, there's a video called Race for Absolute Zero. And it talks all about cold and how our understanding of cold has changed our world. So what's the name of that movie? Uh, the uh, uh, Race for Absolute Zero, if you want to look it up. Okay, so chemical reaction. Here's another example. Putting something into water here in this case, and it changes how um, the elements interact with each other, right? That is an example of a, a chemical reaction. Uh, Sodium. Yeah, I don't think we're going to show that video right now. Okay, so our different states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas, plasma. I think we're all pretty much familiar with those types of things. We have a whole chapter where we talk about gases. That's in, probably not in this class, but next class, so if you're going to continue and learn more. But um, aqueous is our other, not state, but our other little subscript that we'll put on elements. Do you remember what aqueous means? Yeah, yeah, it means dissolved in water. That's right, dissolved in water. So it's not really an official state, but it um, it is something that we need to be aware of. All right, so look at these and see if you can figure out which of the following is a, a physical change. Not burning. What? Not E. Uh, if, you, if you light something on fire and it burns, that's a chemical change. Okay, very good. What about B, when you leave... The, the grape juice in an un, open, unrefrigerated container and turn sour. No, that's that's forming wine. That's that's fermentation. That's right. So that is not a physical uh, reaction or physical change. Uh, I think the answer is C. Oh no, sorry, D. D. The answer is D. Why? Because when water condenses, it's not. It's going from gas to liquid. So that's why you're, uh, something like a, a Coke will sweat. Oh, you mean like a, a Coke can will get wet on the outside? Yeah, a Coke can will get wet on the outside. That's right. <clears throat> that's right. So um, condensation is not a physical change, right? Sorry, a, a, a chemical change. It's a physical change. Okay, very good. How about this one? When water boils on the stove, what are the bubbles that form on the bottom of the, <coughs> the, the stove, or on the bottom of the pan when water is boiling? Oxygen, hydrogen, water, accumulated air. Yeah, I don't know. See, when, when water boils, I don't... I, is, is that hydrogen gas? That's not hydrogen gas. It can't be hydrogen gas. Hmm. Let's see. I guess the water is getting really hot, and so it's going from a liquid to a gas. Maybe it's just water. Is that right? Is it just water? That's right. It's just water. Water is the answer there. Okay. So that's very important to recognize that when water boils, it's not forming oxygen or hydrogen gas. It's not a chemical change. It's just a physical change. So you're changing the water from solid to, or sorry, liquid to gas, but you're not actually making hydrogen or oxygen gas, which is a very important thing to recognize. All right, so let's talk about uh, measurements now. <clears throat> Every time we mention a measurement, we always want to make sure that we recognize that this isn't math class, which is a beautiful, very uh, wonderful thing, but it's more of an artistic use of numbers. Here, our numbers all have units associated with them, all right? So we have to make sure that when we talk about a distance, we put a unit on there of some sort. Back in 1999, there was a, a disaster where uh, a Mars probe was lost because the two teams that were working together were using the different units. And the result was 
Um, they it crashed their $125 million uh, orbiter, right, which is a shame. So units do matter. All right. Um, we also want to speak what we call quantitatively as much as possible. Quantitatively is basically saying, we don't just say something is big or something is long. We want to say how long. And we don't want to say, again, just 203, for example. We want to say 203 meters. Is that really the longest hot dog in the world? Yeah, that's right. Well, at least at the time that I made this slide. 203.8 meters long, the longest hot dog. What do they do with that? I think they eat it. Oh, okay. So, we do also have what are called SI base units. This stands for Standard International Base Units. Um, <clears throat> some people are very adamant about always using standard units whenever you express a length or a mass or whatever, but it's not terribly critical in this class. We will always talk about what units we kind of want to be using. <coughs> but you can also derive units. So, for example, um, if I say the, the length of a given box that I have, right? So here's my box, which is one centimeter uh, tall and one centimeter long. Well, I can express the area as, what is the area here? One centimeter square. That's right, one centimeter square. And that area has slightly different units now, right? The centimeter squared are my new units. So I can derive units by performing math with the units. And just like I had to multiply the one and the one together, I have to make sure I multiply the two centimeters together as well. So the units, the math has to be done on the units as well. We also have ways of expressing uh, large and small numbers with prefixes. And what these prefixes do is they make our, our communication a little bit easier to understand. Like this example here, if somebody's saying something to another person about a particle, but they have to put in very many decimal places, it's going to be hard for somebody to, to uh, listen to that or even to read it and to get what's going on. And so we need to use our prefixes. All right, so some of these prefixes you are familiar with, probably uh, centa. Centa sounds like century or a hundred, right? Um, so there are a hundred centimeters in a meter. Uh, milla, do you remember how many millimeters there are in a centimeter? Ten, that's right, ten. Each little centimeter has ten millimeters in it. So let me draw a little centimeter for you, right? It's about that long. And then there's 10 little ticks of millimeters in that one centimeter, right? One millimeter. Okay? So, centa and milla are uh, two prefixes that I'm hoping you are already familiar with. And micro is not, milla is again a thousand, there's a thousand millimeters in a meter. Micro is um, a million. A million micrometers in a meter. Uh, nano is a billion, pico is a trillion. So really the ones that we'll use the most are milla, uh, probably milla and micro more than anything else, but I think that centa is one that you are already aware of. Going the other way we have kilo, mega, giga, and tera. Kilo, um, a kilometer, right, that's a thousand meters. Mega and giga, we don't really hear much about in terms of in, in, in science much or in the world, I'm sorry, in the world much, but um, <clears throat> the way that I always remember these is I remember the um, file sizes, the file sizes for uh, pictures that I take on my phone, right? Um, although they're not exactly the same types of conversions or same types of units, um, uh, a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, pretty much, and a megabyte is a thousand kilobytes, and a gigabyte is a thousand megabytes. So that's how I remember those prefixes. All right, now let's try to fill in the missing portions of this table here by uh, looking at 
or looking at this first one here, 10 to the minus 9th grams for every nanogram. Now, we should have a conversation about 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the 9th and how that compares to 1 million. Or sorry, in this case, it's 1 billion, right? So 10 to the 9th means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, 9 times, right? And if you do that, you get a billion. 10 to the minus 9, right, means we move the decimal place over uh, 9 times. You take 1 and you move the decimal place over 9 times. Or you're taking, uh, you're dividing by 10 9 times. Okay? Uh, so when we say 10 to the 9th, it's 1 with the decimal place moved over 9 times. And that's basically 8 zeros. 10 to the 9th, that's 1 with 9 zeros after. Okay? So if I say 10 to the minus 9 grams is a nanogram, how many grams will be in a kilogram? 10 to the what? Uh, can you go back the slide? The third, 10 to the third. That's right, 10 to the third grams is a kilogram. So 10 to the minus 12 grams, what's that? That is a picogram. That's right, picogram, very good. Nanometers, how many meters is that? 10 to the minus nano 9, nano 9. That's right, that's a good way to remember it. Nano 9, sounds, sounds together. 10 to the 6 grams, how many grams is that? Can you go back a slide? Mega, mega. That's right, good job. Mega what? Mega gram. Very good, mega gram. Microliter? Micro. Is that 10 to the minus 6? That's right, 10 to the minus 6 liters is not a microliter, microgram, but a microliter. Very good. And 10 to the 9th hertz. What's a hertz? Well, it's just a, a, it's, it's a cycle per second is what it stands for. So it can mean a, a cycle of, of whatever thing. It could be your hard drive, or it could be how fast a wave is passing through a system, right? Um, that is a mega or giga, giga or mega, megahertz, megahertz. That's right. Oh, sorry, giga, giga, giga. Gigahertz is ten to the mi ten to the ninth. Megahertz is ten to the sixth. Okay, so there's lots of tables like this out on the internet nowadays, and they're conversion tables, and they're helpful. But we're not going to spend any brain cells remembering this stuff. This is all what you can ask your phone and what you can ask Google. What we're going to spend our time on instead is knowing how to use these, these what we call conversion factors, right? To know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters is nice, but you can always look it up. But knowing how to use it to answer questions, that's what we want to do. So let's look at some of these common lengths, all right? There's our centimeters and our meters. Uh, the island of Oahu, 60 by 50 kilometers. Here's a human hair. Here's on the human hair a nanowire, right? So that's interesting. And then uh, a meter, right? Three liters of soda pop, a cubic meter. Um, this is a very important one down here. One cubic centimeters centimeter is equal to one milliliter. One cubic centimeter. Now a cubic centimeter um, it has another name in hospitals. Do you remember what it is? Uh, it's a CC. You've heard of a CC before? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. In the hospitals, they use the term CC as a milliliter. One CC is one milliliter. And what that basically, what that means is a cubic centimeter. And so what if I have a box that is one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, that is what a milliliter is. All right, some common tools that we use in the chemistry lab to measure volumes. <coughs> Uh, we have pipettes, flasks, volumetric and Erlenmeyer flasks, where volumetric flasks, they are very accurate. They can make uh, solutions that are very close to the actual correct volume. Uh, graduated cylinders also have a degree of accuracy. And they can also have lots of graduates, so you can get the right uh, volume of material. Erlenmeyer flasks and beakers, they are not made to be accurate. They're just made to contain material 
And they do have graduates on them, but they're just very rough graduates. A burette. This is a burette. And you see that it's labeled, starting from the top, it's labeled as zero, and it counts higher as you go down, because it's trying to see how much you've actually delivered out of the bottle. Um, volumetric flasks and volumetric pipettes, as I mentioned, only measure one value, but they're very, uh, very low in terms of their error in those, in those measurements. All right, mass. Here's a very interesting one. One cc, one cubic centimeter of water, which is one milliliter of water, it has the mass of one gram, which is the, um, the what we call the density of water. The density of water is one gram for every mill. Okay. Um, temperatures. Now, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Fahrenheit and Celsius. And in some countries, they use Celsius. And most countries use Celsius. And the United States uses Fahrenheit. Um, but in the lab, we basically always use Celsius. And sometimes we use a third, which is called Kelvin. Now, the thing we want to begin to recognize for these different systems. Um, first of all, you can see that to go from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius goes from 32 to 212 in terms of Fahrenheit, meaning that there's 180 little ticks between these two marks, the freezing point and the boiling point of water, and there's only 100 of these marks for Celsius. So that means Celsius degrees are what? Bigger or smaller than the degrees for Fahrenheit? Uh, Celsius must be bigger because there's only 100 there and there's 180 for the Fahrenheit. That's right, Celsius degrees are bigger. But if we compare to Kelvin, what we see is that uh, we have the same number, 100, from freezing point to boiling point. And so the, the graduates, the actual degrees for Kelvins are the same as that of Celsius. Now, why did we start dealing with or introducing a, a third kind of uh, temperature measurement system, Kelvin, when we already had Celsius and Fahrenheit. Well, Kelvin, Celsius and Fahrenheit, they were um, glass blowers. They were good at blowing, blowing glass, and they made thermometers because it made them money. But Kelvin did something different. Kelvin was measuring the volume of gases at different temperatures. And if you see this plot here, this is volume of gas along here, and then temperature along the side there. And as we lower the temperature, each one of these um, uh, volumes decreases, right? And you can see if you extrapolate all these lines down, they all meet at one point. So why is it that the volume of the gases is getting smaller as you get them colder? Yeah, the volume should be, should be, the, the gas should be going to a liquid, so that means it might have a smaller volume. That's right, it's going to a liquid. The gas molecules are moving all over the place, but when you turn them into a liquid, they condense and get smaller, right? And then if you get a liquid to a solid, sometimes they even condense more. In the case of things like water, then it'll actually become less dense. But, um, what Kelvin recognized here and what others recognized is that there's a point in which the volume of the system becomes zero. How would that be? If there was actually atoms there, you couldn't become zero. And would it actually continue to become negative, smaller than nothing? Right? So this didn't make any sense. And so what they said was there's probably a point where you can't get any cold. And gradually, when they realized that temperature was actually a measurement of, of motion, then this made more sense. Because here, it's just measuring molecules that are moving faster, and we slow them down until we get to a point where we hold them still, until they stop. And so Celsius and Fahrenheit, they had different scales based on different chemical reactions. But um, Kelvin was... Uh, looking at a scale based on, on motion. Right? Zero meaning no motion, and then moving up with the same units as Celsius, but going on basically to as much motion as you wanted to, to, to 
um, suggest or record. All right, so we can convert from Celsius to Kelvin simply by adding the 273, uh, adding 273 degrees. So if we wanted to know what is the Kelvin temperature of a solution at 25, what would we do? Just add the 273 to 25? That's right. We would just add 273 to 25, and that would be our 298 Kelvin. Now, um, sometimes it, we forget. Do I add that 273 or I subtract the 273? And you can always remember that by remembering that Kelvin will never be a negative number. And so if you have a value like 10 Kelvin and you want to convert it to Celsius, um, or the other way around, if you have 10 Celsius and you want to convert it to Kelvin, you're not going to be subtracting the 273 from 10 Celsius to convert it to Kelvin, because Kelvin will never be a negative number. It's a measurement of movement, right? It's a measurement of temperature as well, but it, you can also think of it as a measurement of movement. So you're always going to have some movement. And if, if it's at zero, if it's absolutely zero, that's where you'd have no movement, for example. Okay. So we also always have what are called uncertainties whenever we make a measurement. And there's errors, and that's not a problem. But we always want to make sure we express our values with the appropriate amount of error. So that people are clear when we write it down a number how much error there is in our value. Okay. Um, we also need to make sure that when we talk about uh, measurements, uh, you know, oftentimes we want to know uh, something about a system. Right? We want to know what percentage, what's the likelihood of getting coronavirus? Right? What's the, the likelihood of, of being able to detect? The presence of an antibody, right? Um, what is the concentration of the antibody within people's bloodstreams, right? These types of questions, oftentimes methods for determining uh, these, answering these questions, will have errors in them. And we know that, that's not surprising, but we need to make sure that moving forward, whenever we kind of think about this sort of thing, we know to what degree those errors are impactful and what degree they're, they're not that important. Okay, And so um, if, for example, I say that on average I'm a perfect golfer, on average I always hit it in the hole, does that make me a good golfer? Yeah, I guess so. That means you're a pretty good golfer. Well, you might think that, but if I think of it this way. So here is my uh, golf green, and here's my flag, right? If I hit the ball over here, and then over here, and then over here, and then over here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here you might say, well, the average location of the ball is right in the middle. But if I never hit it in the middle, that doesn't make me a, a good golfer. So just because we have an average kind of in the middle of this area doesn't mean that if the average is right, it doesn't mean that the system or the, the method for measuring the value is good. Um, we want to have accuracy. We want it to be the right value. So here we have uh, um, a cluster that isn't clustered around the, the bullseye. Um, here we have a cluster that's clustered in the bullseye and they're all very close. So it's both accurate and precise. Here we have a cluster that is off the bullseye. So it's precise, but it's not in the right place. So it's low accuracy. Okay. Um, so in general, uh, we want something that produces high accuracy and high precision. Now, sometimes it's hard to remember which is which, which is accuracy and which is precision. And the way that I remember it is if it's if it's all clustered together like that, it looks kind of pretty. Like here we have our golf balls clustered together. And pretty sounds like precise. So precision is the cluster. Accuracy is if you're in the right location. All right.
Now, let's see how we can uh, attribute the error associated with a measurement in something like um, this, this scale. Maybe it's a measuring, maybe it's measuring mass, maybe it's measuring volume. Okay. Let's say I go to the store and I want to uh, sell my ring to somebody and they're going to give me money for my ring. And they told, tell me that my ring weighs 21 grams. 21 grams. Um, does that look right? Yeah, I think so. There's 10 marks. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yeah, so it's just over 21. But isn't it higher than 21? Shouldn't I get a little bit more for my ring? I guess so. Yeah, that's right. In fact, when I make this measurement as a scientist, I say it's 21, and then I make an estimate. So maybe I say 21 point what? 4? 21.4? Maybe 21.4, maybe 21.3, whatever. That estimate would be okay, because that's what we do as a scientist. If I went to a better place that had a better uh, instrument, then I could get better results. Here I have 21 and 22, and so I can see that this is 21.1, 2, 3. And now I can see that I have 21.3, and my estimate would allow me to uh, not just have 21.3, but my estimate would be 21.3, I don't know, what do you think? 21.32. 21.3, whoops, 0.32, all right? So you can tell how many what we call significant figures you should be able to have, and you can express your numbers by letting people see 21.3, that was something that I could read on my device, and then this one, the last one, is always our estimate, okay? So we express our estimate in our significant figures like some numbers, like a dozen, a dozen eggs here, for example, they have um, are, are exact, and they won't limit the number of significant figures. So 12 inches in a foot, 2.54 centimeters in an inch, those numbers won't limit the significant figures in any, any uh, measurements because they're exact numbers. All right, so which one of these is a reasonable answer for how much volume is in this container? Mm, let's see. So you got 7.123, 7 7.3, 7 7 not 7.4. I can see it's not 7.4. Do where do you measure on that curvy thing? Oh right, you always measure at the bottom of the meniscus. We call this is the meniscus. We always measure at the bottom. Okay, so 7.3, uh, I think I think C, 7.35. What's wrong with B? Well, maybe B. Well, no, because B, you don't have an estimate, and it's not 7.4. So you have to have three significant digits. So it has to be either A, C, or D, and it's not up to 7.64. Okay, very good. That's right. So the answer is C. And again, we know we have the three significant digits, one, seven point, the seven, the three, and the five, because we can see for sure the seven, three here, and then we estimated that last one. Okay. Oh, here's another one. It looks very similar, but it's a different problem. Wait. Why is that? Why why is the number going down again? Oh yeah, it goes from six to seven here. This must be a a, a, a burette, right? We're delivering um, solution and we're trying to see how much we deliver. So this time we have to see the six point five, six point six. I think it's C again. That's right, it is C again, six point six two. And again, our two is our our estimate. Okay, so these are the rules for expressing significant figures, okay? And we use these rules to tell people how well, uh, what kind of a device we had to measure, right? In terms of uh, 
how many digits are actual and how many are an estimate. All right. Um, so if it's not a zero digit, then it's a significant digit. All right. So 21.3 has three significant digits. This 2134.56, six significant digits. <clears throat> if there's zero between significant digits, then they will be significant. All right. If there is zeros to the right of a significant digit, they'll only be significant if there's a decimal place there. So zeros to the left are not significant, and zeros to the right without a decimal place are not significant. But if there's zeros with a decimal place, then they are significant. So see how 20 and 300 only has one significant digit. 0 0.0002, that's just one as well. 0 0.0050, there's two there because the five is significant and the zero to the right is must be an estimate, right? That's why it's included. Here, where's the estimate? I guess it's the two, right? Yeah, that's right. Two has to be the estimate. Okay, so what do you think here? How many significant figures in this problem? Three. Yeah, that's right. Three significant figures. How about this one here? Why is there a zero at the end? I guess that was the, that was the, that was the, uh, what's it called? The, the, the what? The estimate? Yeah, the estimate. Yeah, that's right. So that means that how many significant digits? All four. That's right. Four significant digits. How about this one? How many significant digits there? Mm, I guess it's just one. That's right. Just one significant digit. Because why didn't you include these? Well, because there's no values there. And there's no decimal place to show us that the rest are significant. That's right. Good. How about this one here? Well, there's the five. And then after that, those two are significant. But the one in front is not significant. So just three. Very good. Excellent. Here's another one. Hmm. Is that zero in front just trying to trick us? Yeah, you're right. It's just trying to trick us. So how many are just are significant here? Just five. That's right. Just five significant digits. Very good. Now, how do we add, subtract, multiply, divide values and determine how many significant figures should be in the answer. Well, this is how. If it's multiplication and division, all we do is we perform the multiplication and division in our calculator, and then we count the number of significant digits in the different values that were multiplied or divided, and we just, our answer has to have the fewest number of significant figures. So, our 13.49709375, that's a value that we get in the calculator. It's only going to have how many significant figures? Two. How did you know two? Because you have something with three and something with four and something with two. That's right. And so we had to use the one that was the smallest. And that's our two significant figures. And that means we take our two significant figures, the one and the three here, and we look to the right, and we have to round that three according to what's to the right. And that's a four. But there's the 9. Yeah, but you don't round to the next one and the next one and so forth. You only round to the one that's immediately to the right of the 3. So what would our answer be? Just 13. That's right. Just 13. Just two significant figures. All right. So here's a multiplication problem. And notice they're not asking what's the answer to the equation, the multiplication problem, right? They're just answering, asking. How many significant figures should be in the answer to this problem? What do you think? How many significant figures should there be? Well, you got only one in the second second number, so it has to be one. That's right. Only uh, only one in this, right? How many significant figures are here? Four, and over here one. That's right. So the answer is only going to have one significant. Addition and subtraction is different. Addition and subtraction, you always have to, to line up the values with the decimal place in the same point. Add them up in your calculator, get the answer, whatever you need to do. 
but the answer will only have as many significant digits past the decimal, or maybe sometimes it's before the decimal, as the, uh, the least significant digits uh, to the right of the decimal place, or in the sometimes before, as um, or the answer will only have the same number as the least for the answer. Now, that doesn't mean the least number of significant digits, because here we have four, and here we have four, and here we have four significant digits. Um, but that's not how we governed our four. We knew that we had to cut off our answer right here, because the two cuts off in the tenths place, as opposed to cutting off in the hundredths and the thousandths place. So our answer had to cut off in the tenths, because this problem, this, this value, this measurement here, cut off in the tenths place. Okay, so how many sig figs result from the problem? Uh, can you can you write it out for me? Okay, sure. Yeah. So we got 10.33 minus r minus 0 0.0344. Okay, very good. Now. It's very important that we write it out. If we don't write it out like that, then we can get confused about where the significant digits should go. So I'm going to do the math here. 10.33 minus R.0344. Then I get 10.2956. And then I write my answer here. 10.2956. Very good. Now, how many significant figures should I have? How do I determine where I cut off my significant figures? Well, the top one only goes to the, the hundreds place. So your answer can only be in the hundreds place as well. That's right. So here's the hundreds place. So I, I have to cut this off, whoops, to the hundreds place there. So it's going to be 10.9 or 10.29, but that five rounds it up. So the answer is going to be 10.30, and the answer is going to have four significant digits. Now, why didn't my answer have only three significant digits? Because this one had four and this one had three significant digits. Why did my answer have four and not three? You don't, you don't, that's not how you do it when you do addition and subtraction. When you do addition and subtraction, you just line it up like we did over there. Multiplication and division, that's where you count and the one that has the fewest, you just have, that's your answer. But here, we have to add it up, line it up, add it up, and or subtract it in this case, and uh, use the one that had the, the significant figures, the fewest in terms of the uh, decimal. That's right. Good. All right. So here's another one where we have a, a mixed problem in this case, a mixed problem. We have um, the number of uh, <coughs> significant figures from first a multiplication within the parentheses, and then we have to subtract, and then we have to, do, to divide. Do you know how many numbers of significant digits we're going to have? Uh, I think I have to write this one down, too. Okay, let's do it. So first we have our 10 times our 10.88. If I just do those two things right there, my answer is going to be what? 10 times 10.88, that's 108.8. But how many significant digits should I have? Well, the 10 only has 3. And the 10.88 has 4. So if I have 3 and 4, my answer has to have how many? 3, because this is multiplication. Okay, very good. So my answer has to have 3. So I'm going to round that to what? 109. Very good. And now my next step is to subtract the 12.2. So how do I do that? Line up the decimal points. Very good. 12.2. So now I go my uh, 109 minus the 12.2. And I get 96.8. So how many significant figures are we going to have there after my 96.8? You only get to keep two. That's right. I only get to keep two because I need to cut off right here because there's no other significant figures over there. So that's going to be 97. And then I divide by my 2.2. 2. 
So we don't really care what the answer is, but can you tell how many significant figures we're going to have? We're going to have just two, just two significant figures. That's right, just two significant figures. All right, now, um, why did I collect significant figures after every step? Do we always have to do it that way? No, you just have to do it when you, like you said, if you go from multiplication to division and then to some addition and subtraction, then you have to you have to go back and collect every time you go from one to the other. That's right. So typically in our problems that we solve in this class will just be a lot of multiplication and division, not a lot of addition and subtraction. So we'll only have to collect significant figures at the end. So that's that's really nice. All right. Now we're going to focus now on our conversion factors. Conversion factors are uh, numbers, basically, that are expressed in fractions that equal each other on the top and the bottom. And when a number equals each other on the top and the bottom, for example, if I have, uh, here we go, 12 point, or 2.2 .2 divided by 2.2, .2, what is that number? What does that equal? It just equals 1. That's right. So 2.2 .2 times 2.2 .2 equals 1. All right. Um, and what happens if I multiply a value like x times 2.2 .2 over 2.2? .2? What do I get? You just get x. That's right, because anytime you multiply a value by 1, you get 1. And so we kind of take advantage of that and call uh, any any statement, like 2.2 .2 over 2, uh, that equals 1, a conversion factor. Conversion factor. So we have lots of ways that we can express uh, values and have them equal to 1. Can 1 over 12 equal 1? No, no. 1 over 12 doesn't equal 1. Well, what if we talk about 1 foot or 12 inches? Oh, well, yeah, I guess then kind of like equaling one. That's right, it's kind of like equaling one. They're the same. One foot is the same as 12 inches. Now I can use that as a conversion factor then to answer questions like how many uh, feet, whoops, feet, FT, let's try that again. How many feet are there in 38 inches? Why don't you just divide by 12? That's right. But what we have here is the ability to take that 38 and multiply it by our conversion factor. And our conversion factor is 1 foot equals 12 inches. And so what that does for me is it helps me see the kind of math that needs to occur. So then I take the 38 divided by our 12 and I get 3.16 as my answer, and that is my answer with the units in feet. Now, like we talked about before also, our inches, just like our 38 divided by our 12 here to get 3.16, our inches also have to cancel out. They divide out, and our feet remains behind. So like we talked about, we have to multiply and divide our, our um, units as well. And by doing this, what I see is the evidence in front of me of how this conversion factor can take me from inches to feet. Okay? So these conversion factors become very valuable. More valuable than just remembering what to do. And this is what I really want you to do. I want you to use the conversion factors. Many of you are smart and you're going to say, oh, you just have to divide by 12 or multiply by 12. Or the answer is C. But that is not the, the kind of thing that we want to get done. What we're trying to do is use conversion factors so that when we come to a problem, and that's a problem is something we don't know how to answer. It's not something that we already know how to answer. The problem is when we don't know how to answer. And if we can truly answer questions that we don't know how to answer ever, we've never seen it before, using conversion factors, then the conversion factors become valuable to us. Okay, so 
here are a bunch of conversion vectors. Right? Here are a bunch of conversion vectors. Like we said, one foot over 12 inches, that's basically one. Also 12 inches over one foot, that's the same on top and bottom. A thousand millimeters is the same as one meter. All right. 2.54 centimeters, that's the same as one inch. Okay, but one of these conversion factors is not right. Can you find out which one's not right? Uh, I don't think that 1,000 liters is one. It's supposed to be like 1,000 milliliters per liter, right? Well, this one here, yeah. Yeah, you're right. That one is not a correct conversion factor. And that happens all the time. We put the units messed up or our values messed up because you can either switch the values here or you can switch the units and both of those will fix that conversion factor. All right, so in all of these, the conversion factor, what we have on top is equal to what we have on the bottom. And now conversion factors allow us to answer questions like this. Uh, I can't go on the big kid rides until I'm 1.1 meters. How tall is that in feet? Uh, I know what to do here. You just wait. Hold on just a second. I'm less interested in knowing what the answer is and more interested in seeing that we organize it correctly. But I know how to answer this one already. Yeah, but what I really want to do is we want to take time using our conversion factors and setting up our methods for solving problems so that when we come to problems that we're not sure about, we can use our methods. So let me introduce to you our method. To solve these problems, we always start with an equal sign. We start with an equal sign. And then, after we have our equal sign, we write a line like this. And that line begin, acts as kind of like the, the line between our numerator and our denominator, right? Uh, so we can build conversion factors on this line to get our answer. After we write our equal sign and our line, then we write the units that we're after to the right of the equal sign. And that usually takes a little bit of time. You have to think about reading the question and find out what the units you're after. Can you tell what units you're after here? Feet. We want to know feet. That's right. Feet. So I'm going to write feet here. Now I go over here to the left. And at the top left, I start with the units that they give me. What units do they give you to start off with? Meters. We start with meters. That's right. 1.1 meters. So I write 1.1 meters. And then I use conversion factors to convert my meters to feet. And I know that the conversion factor that I want to have has to have meters down here because I need to get rid of those units. Now, can I go to feet? Do you know how many feet are in meters? No, I could look it up on the internet. We could. We could. We could look it up on the internet. But what I'm interested in right now is using multiple conversion factors because sometimes um, the questions can't be looked up on the internet because usually they don't use simple things like this. But we're going to use simple things to begin to teach us how to use the method, right, which is called dimensional analysis or unit analysis. So I'm going to go from meters to centimeters because I know how to do that. How many centimeters are in a meter? A hundred. hundred centimeters per meter. That's right, so 100 here and 1 meter there. Very good. Now I'm going to convert my units from centimeters to inches because I see that that is one of the conversion factors down here. 2.54 centimeters per inch. 2.54 centimeters for every 1 inch. Now what we can do, can we do? You can go from centimeter or inches. You can go from inches to feet. Very good. I can go from inches here to feet. Excellent. And what, how do I put the numbers down? Put 12 and 1. So 12 and 1? Yeah. Oh wait, no, 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 no. You need, there's, there's 12 inches in a foot. Okay, so the 12 goes down here and one foot there. Would it have mattered if I did that wrong? Yes, you get the wrong answer. That's right. So now I can see that my units have gone from meters. Meters cancel out here because they're divided out. Centimeters are divided out there. Inches are divided out there. And I'm left with feet. And that's what I wanted to have. So making sure I've written my units there. 
allow me to see what uh, units I end up with. And I can see how the units have gone away as I've used different conversion factors. And now in my calculator, all I have to do is everything on top, 1.1, 1 .1, 100, 1, and 1. I divide by what's on the bottom. So I just, whatever's on top, 1.1 1 .1 times 100 times 1 times 1. I'm not going to do that because I know if you multiply by 1, it doesn't do anything. Divide by 1, divided by 2.54, and divided by 12. Okay? So my answer is 3.6 feet. 3.6 feet. So, like we mentioned, you start with your units, use conversion factors, find the correct conversion factors, multiply everything on top, and divide by everything on the bottom, and then you get the appropriate number, or sorry, the, the, the answer. Why did we only use two significant figures? Well, we started with two. We started with two at the 1.1. That's right. So we started with 1.1, that's just two significant figures, so we end with two significant figures there. All right, so given that 2.205 pounds is equivalent to one kilogram, which of the following is an appropriate conversion factor? B, it has to be B. That's right, B, because 2.205 pounds per kilogram. Here our numbers are mixed up or our units are mixed up, right? So very good. So, what's the mass of 23.3 pounds expressed in kilograms? You just have to divide. Well, that's fine if you've got it in your mind, but remember, what I'm more interested in is I'm more interested in is seeing the method. But my chemistry teacher taught me just what to do before. That's fine. But what I want you to do is I want you to use the method. Don't fight against it because gradually we're going to get to point the point where we it's not intuitive to us what to do. And if we don't use the method, we'll be in trouble. So the right answer is not really important what this answer is. More important is the setup. So let's see if we can set it up there. Okay? So what do I do first? Write an equal sign and write a line. Okay. And I like to blow out all the bad air when I write my equal sign. Very good, very good. Like that? Yeah, like that. So, what do I do now? Write the units that you're after to the right of the equal sign. Is it important to write those units? Yes, it is, because if you don't write those units, then you don't know what tri your units you're trying to get. So what are the units that I'm trying to get? Kilograms. You want to know expressed in kilograms. So that's right, kilograms. And so I start with what? Top here. 23.3 pounds. 23.3 pounds. Very good. Now my conversion factor. What should it be? Well, pounds have to be on the bottom. That's right. Pounds have to be on the bottom. And what can be on top? We have a conversion factor there, so kilograms can go on top. Kilograms go on top. Now what values? 2.205 goes with the pounds, and 1 goes with the kilograms. Like that? Yeah. Now what do I do? Take the 23.3 and divide by 2.205, and that should be your answer. Okay, very good. If we do that in the calculator, we should get our 10.6 kilograms. It's 23.3 divided by our 2.205. Now again, we can see that the pounds do drop out and I'm left with the units that I want. So that's how I know that I'm doing the right kind of math. Okay, how many kilometers, kilometers, km, are in 25 feet? Let's do it again. What do I do to the right of my equal sign? Write your equal sign first. Okay, yep, what goes to the right of it now? Kilometers. Km. Good. All right, where do I start with? 25 feet. Okay, 25 feet goes here. And I know that feet has to go down here. Where am I going to convert my feet to? 
Um, hmm. I know, I know uh, inches. I know feet go to inches. All right, good. Inches. And what numbers go with the feet and the inches? Twelve and what? Which was the twelve, top or bottom? Bottom. Twelve goes down here? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Twelve goes with the inches. Yeah, twelve goes with the inches, one foot down. Okay, then I'm going to have what down here? You need to get rid of inches, so put inches down there. Inches, very good. And then inches is going to go to what? What do you know? Uh, I could look up inches to kilometers. Mm, we don't have to do that. We've been given inches to centimeters here, right? Oh, yeah. Inches to centimeters. Okay, so where's the 2.54 go? With the centimeters. 2.54 centimeters for every inch. Good. Now, what goes down here? Centimeters. And what goes up here? Meters. How did you decide to go to meters? I don't know. I just know meters. Very good. What is it? Uh, it's 100 centimeters for every meter. Okay, 100 centimeters for every meter. Now, are we done? No, we're not done. We're in meters and we need to be in kilometers. So go from meters to kilometers. Okay, so meters to kilometers. What's our number there? It's 1,000. 1,000 meters for kilometers. Okay, 1,000 meters for... No, no, no. 1,000 goes on the bottom. Okay, one kilometer is 1,000 meters. Yeah, good. All right, excellent. So, 25 feet to inches. Inches just cancels out. Centimeters cancels out. And meters cancels out. It's all being kilometers. So, to get the answer, I take my 25 times 12 times 2.54 divided by 100 and then divided by our 1,000. Okay. 0 0.0762. What are the units? Move the calculator. Oh yeah, kilometers. 0 0.762 point, point zero zero seven six two kilometers. Very good. 0 0 0.00762 kilometers. So what does that do for us? Mm, let's see. A is 7.6 kilometers. C is 760 kilometers. How many significant digits should our answer have? That's a good question. How many significant digits should it have? Well, all the answers only have two, so I guess two. Well, there's a none of these. Could it be none of these? We started with 25. That's how we know we only have two significant digits. Okay, very good, very good. Now, you see the answer up there? I don't, I don't. I think it has to be E, none of these. Let's see. Okay, we're right. It's not any of these. It was 7.6 times 10 to minus 3 kilometers. All right? Again, the minus 3 means that means I move my decimal place over three points, three places. One, two, three. All right, very good. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, density. Density. Uh, density is um, an intensive property, which means that it's related, it's the same for a given chemical. So the density of water is the same here as it is at the top of the mountain. Um, the mass of water might be different. I might have some water here and might have more water over there. The volume of water might be different. I have, might have more in the ocean than I have in the lake. lake. But the density of the water is an intensive property, meaning it's always the same regardless of what sample of water you have. So in that way, sometimes the density or intensive properties can, can help you know what chemical or material you're dealing with. Okay? So density is a ratio of the mass of the material. Density equals the mass of the material over the volume of that material. Okay. Um, have you heard of density before? Yeah, I forgot about it, but I remember now. Yeah, so density is the mass of the material for the volume of the material. Okay. Um, it's temperature sensitive, so you have to generally talk about a single temperature, like ice has a different temperature than, than water. Right. Um, and for gases, it's much lower, and so we generally express densities in 
grams per liter. But for the rest of our chemicals, we can usually express our density in the form of grams per milliliter. Okay? So, a glass bead with a mass of 5.96 is dropped into a beaker of water containing 10.2 milliliters. If the resulting volume is 12.3 milliliter, what is the density of the bead? So I need to get to get the density of the bead, I need to get the mass of the bead and the volume of the bead. Do I have the mass of the bead? Yeah, it tells you 5.96 is the mass of the bead. Okay, so I got 5.96. That's grams. How do I get the volume of the bead? I guess if you put it in the container, then the change in the volume of the water will tell you the, the volume of the bead. Is that right? Is that what we're trying to realize here? That's right. That's right. So let's draw a little picture. If I have a container, right, and inside that container I have some water, uh, and then this is measuring the water at 10.2 milliliters. If I put the bead in the water, here's the bead, the water goes up, right? And why does the water go up? Because the, the volume of the bead takes up the space of that water, and so the water has to be moved up. That's right. And if the new volume here is 12.3, then the difference between the 12.3 and the 10.2, that is the, the volume of the bead. So if I take my 12.3 minus the 10.2, I get 2.1. So, what is that? 10.2, that's the volume of the bead. 10.2? No, 2.1. Oh, 2.1. 2.1. That's the volume of the bead. 2.1 is the volume of the bead. And so, what do I do with that? Well, density is mass divided by volume, so you have to take the 5.96 and divide it by 2.1. Like that? Yeah, that's it. So 5.96 divided by the 2.1, what is that going to be? Is that our 2.8? Yeah. Okay, very good. Now, I also kind of knew it was either C or D, right? How did I know? I don't know. Because the units, right? The units had to be grams per milliliter because we're talking about mass divided by volume. Okay, yeah, I get it. All right, so sometimes you can use the units to help you answer a question. All right, so here's some questions now comparing densities of different materials. Um, a sample metal of X has the same mass as a sample metal of Y, but the sample metal of X has a smaller volume. So which metal, X or Y, has a, a greater density? Okay, so let me draw a picture of X and Y. Here's metal X, draw it on a plate there, and I'm going to draw metal Y, let's see, how is Y different? Y has the same mass, but Y has a, a bigger volume. Okay, so it has a bigger volume, but the same mass. Does that look like a bigger volume? Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, very good. So, larger volume, but same mass. So which one is more dense? If they're the same mass, then X has to be more dense. It's taking up less space for the same mass. That's right. X is more dense. Very good. Um, we could also have done that by kind of writing numbers for the, the masses. If we knew that all both of these were, let's say, some mass, let's just give it a mass of 10 grams. And if we knew that this one was 2 milliliters, but this one was only 1 milliliter, that would allow us to identify the densities, the difference in the densities. So what would be the density of this one over here? Mass divided by milliliters, so that would be 10 grams per milliliter. Yeah, the density here would be 10 grams per milliliter. But the other one over here would be what? Only 5. 5 grams per milliliter, because 10 divided by 2 is 5 grams for every milliliter. Very good. That's right. So, that's another way 
how we can kind of think about this problem. So here's another question, very similar. Sample metal of X has the same volume as the sample metal of Y, but the sample metal of Y has less mass. So this time they have the same what? Same volume. They have the same volume. Okay, so I have the same volume, so I have to draw them with the same volume this time. Here's my X, here's my Y. Which one has a larger mass? Sample X has more mass. Okay. Y has less mass, so sample X has more. So let's give me some numbers. What should we use as the volume? Uh, use use uh, 5. 5 is the volume. Okay, so 5 milliliters. How about this one? It's the same, 5 milliliters. Yeah, okay, they both have the same. Now what about the mass? Which one is more massive? Mm. X has more mass, so give it 10. So 10 grams, and Y is what? Give it 5. 5 grams. All right, so now given these numbers, now these are just made up numbers, right? But why can we do that? Well, it might help us. Here, I think it's going to help us because X has a density of 10 divided by 5. That's 2. Right, 2 grams for every milli. 10 divided by 5. But here it's what? Just 1. 1 gram for every milli. Very good. So we can see that X has the larger density, greater density. Yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. One more. Okay. Sample of metal Y has a smaller volume than a sample of metal, sorry, sample of metal X has a smaller volume than a sample of metal Y. So I'll draw the volume of X. It's smaller, this time I'll make sure I make it clear, than Y. Right? It's smaller than Y. So X has a smaller volume than Y. And the sample metal Y has a greater mass than the metal X. So which one has a greater mass? Why? I don't think we're going to be able to do this one. Why not? Because Y has greater volume and greater mass. So we don't know the, the, the relationship. X has smaller volume and smaller mass. So, for example, give X uh, five, no, ten milliliters. X is ten milliliters? Yeah, and give Y five milliliters. Okay, now what? Well, give Y ten grams, and X five grams. Okay, so are, aren't they the same? Well, they might be the same. But we just made these up, so we could also put in uh, Y having 100 grams. Oh, so you're saying it could be 10 or it could be 100, it's still going to have a greater mass. And if it's 10 there, then this density is going to be very large, and this one is going to be small, whereas if this is uh, 10 and 10, then they'll be the same. Okay, very good. So we're not going to be able to determine this based on the data. That's good. Okay, very good. Now, let's use our density as a conversion factor. Blood has a density of 1.05. Don't talk about blood. What? I get kind of sick if you talk about blood. Okay. Well, let's pretend like it's fig blood. Fig blood has a density of 1.05 grams for every cubic centimeter. From that, we can write these two conversion factors. 1.50 grams per blood per milliliter of blood, or 1 milliliter of blood for every 1.05 grams of blood. So these statements are statements about the density, and that information allows us to um, use these values as conversion factors. Okay? So before we were using conversion factors like simply saying 12 inches in a, a foot or 100 centimeters in a meter, but now we can use density as a conversion factor. 
And that becomes important for this kind of a question. So here we have a crash in the lab. We spill two quarts of mercury. And the hazmat team says, what's the mass of mercury on the ground? We have to figure that out. How are we going to figure that out? You just divide by the 12. If you take the two and you... I can't really tell. Yeah, you can't tell. We probably could if we sat and thought about it. But there's also some problems if we make some um, wrong decisions while we're thinking. And this doesn't mean you're dumb if you don't know how to do it. Because smarts isn't about always remembering how to get something done. Smarts is being able to put yourself in a situation that you can answer the question even though you don't know how to do it to start off with. So, time for our cleansing breath. If we write an equal sign and then do a cleansing breath while we draw our line. Okay, now what do we put to the right of the equal sign? The mass, the mass. So put um, grams, grams of mercury. Very good. And it's good to be specific. You can't just put grams. You have to put grams of mercury. Okay. Now, what can we start with over to the bottom, the top left here? Two quarts. Two quarts of mercury. All right. 2.0 quarts of our mercury. Now, what are we going to do? Convert the quarts to, they told us about what? They told us quarts to liters. So convert the quarts to liters. All right. So I go from quarts here, whoops, QT of mercury to liters of mercury. All right. And what is the conversion factor? One goes on top, 1.0567 on the bottom. One, 1 1.0567 quarts on the bottom. Very good. Now I go from what? Liters of mercury. Liters of mercury to what? Well, the density is given in milliliters, so why don't you go to milliliters of mercury? Okay, very good. So we're going to be using the density later on here, the milliliters of mercury, whoops, milliliters to grams of mercury, and that's where we want to be. So we went to milliliters of mercury. How many milliliters? Thousand, thousand milliliters for every liter. Very good. Now, how many grams per liter? It's thirteen point six nine. It says thirteen point six nine grams for every milliliter of mercury. All right. Very good. So if you take the calculator, two times a thousand times thirteen point six nine divided by our one point zero five six seven, we should get our answer, which is. going to be a pretty big number, right? Let's see if we, what we get. 2 divided by 1.0567 times 1,000 times 13.69. 25,000? 25, 000, 25, yeah. How many significant digits? Uh, we started with 2, so 2. So 26,000 grams of mercury on the ground. Okay. Absolutely wonderful job. Well, well, well done. Okay, here's some other practice problems. Um, should we do one of these practice problems? Okay. Let's see. The factor label method, use the factor label method, number seven, to convert an area of 124 feet squared to square meters. Do you know how to do that? Uh, I don't know how many meters are in a feet. But we don't need to know. We can do it. We can just write an equal sign. Okay. What's next? Draw a line and breathe out. Oh, yeah. Whew. Okay. Now, right, uh, what units do we want at the right? Meters. Meters. Square meters. Meters squared. All right. Meters squared like that. What do we start with the top left? 124 feet squared. 124 feet squared. Very good. And then we go from what? Feet squared to what? Where are we going to go? Uh, I, get, I, I know inches. I know inches. You know inches? 
Yeah, like that. We want to go inches squared. Yeah, I guess so, because feet squared is an area, right? Yeah, that's right. So, for example, if this is one foot by one foot, whoops, right? Yeah. Then that's also equivalent to 12 inches by 12 inches. So one foot squared would be how many inches squared? 12 inches squared? No, not 12. You have to multiply the 12 by the 12. Oh, so 144. 144 inches squared. That's right. One foot squared is 144 inches squared. So when you're squaring, you have to make sure you think of that as 1 squared and the 12 squared for 144. All right, now where are we going to go? Inches to what? Centimeters. I know, it's, I know centimeters. Okay, very good. Centimeters squared. How many inches in centimeters? One inch. 2.54 centimeters. 2.54 centimeters. Very good. Now, centimeters to what? Meters. I know meters. Very good. I guess we got to keep the square on there, don't we? Yeah, you got to do that. Okay, now, what is the number of meters to centimeters? One to a hundred. Like that? Well, kind of. You gotta square the hundred. That's right, because it's squared. And I guess I gotta square this as well, 2.54. Yeah. Okay, so put it in this calculator. What do we get? We got 124 times 12 times 12, right? I have to square it. Okay. Keep going. All right, times 2.54. Divided by, you have to do the 2.54 twice. Oh yeah, times 2.54 twice. Uh, divided by what? 100 twice. Divided by 100. Divided by 100. All right, so 11.51. How many significant digits? Three. You started with three. 124, so 11.5 meters squared. Let me do that in the calculator a different way. 124 times 12, where's my square button, there it is, squared, times 2.54 squared, divided by 100 squared, okay, so I get the same answer that way. Okay, good. Can we stop now? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. All right, very good, excellent work. Thank you.